And uh, we've got a caller, but before we go to him, I want to mention one other piece of calculus that's in this equation that we didn't talk about in the last block. And that is that uh, the state legislatures, some people in the legislature do feel that the state should get credit for the number of times that it gave the schools more money than the law required before the Great Recession hit. So some people think that that calculus should be in there and that that should be part of the um, part of the equation. We have uh, former state Senator Frank Antonori on the line. And, uh, uh, Senator, it's good to hear from him again. I don't know if you remember me. We met a couple of times when I was news director at K-Gun. So it's, I'm, I'm honored oh, okay. that you're listening to the show. Well, uh, you know, I was listening, and you kind of hit on what I was going to hit on in that little statement you just made there, and that's that's a key piece that I think is being left out here. The legislature is not arguing with the Arizona Supreme Court decision that states that the legislature is required to give a 2% inflator to public education annually. Right. I don't think the state Senate president or even the Speaker of the House is arguing with that. What they're arguing with is a Superior Court judge in Maricopa County who has become an appropriator and defining a mm-hmm. specific amount of money based on her calculations, which is, in many opinions of many people, a, a conflict of the state constitution that says the legislature shall appropriate, appropriate funds uh, with regard to the budget. Correct. If you look at, and this is to what you just said as you came back from the break there, if you look at, at the point the proposition was approved by the voters, and if you use basic baseline budgeting principles, where if you take the amount of money that was currently being funded to education upon passing the proposition, if you baseline that and add 2%, and then the next year with that 2% added, you baseline it again and add 2%, right. and then baseline it again and add 2%, the legislature, theoretically, and this will be the legal argument that I think is what's going to be appealed, can argue legitimately that they have met the will of the voters and have, since that initiative has been passed, provided a 2% increase to the baseline each year since that initiative has passed. That includes years where education funding even went up to some as 8 9 or 10% when we had those boom years in, right. in 2004, 2005, and 2006 after the, the uh, uh, 9-11 recession that we had. And we had a nice little spurt of growth and education funding increased significantly during that time. What the Superior Court judge in Maricopa County is saying is the clock ends and the board gets erased after every budget cycle, and it's right. 2% on top of, and that's the argument. And, and unless the court wants to make the argument that they have the authority under the Arizona Constitution to make appropriations, which I think will set up a constitutional crisis in the state, because quite frankly... The Constitution clearly states that the treasurer is only allowed to disperse funds upon authority given to him by the legislature. And if the legislature does not give the treasurer the authority to expend the funds, I don't know what the court's going to do. I don't I know, mean, but the, it's dangerous the governor to think that controls they controls the state police. Yep. They work for him or her. <laughs> they can't compel anybody. So what's the court do? They can make arguments all day long if there's no compelling authority to force payment under law. Uh, if both the legislature and the governor uh, disagree with it, we have a constitutional crisis well, in let me Arizona ask you where let me, let we me have ask a conflict this, between the three branches of government. I think we would. And, and you know, a long history of covering the news tells me you never know what a judge will do. And they are perfectly willing, past history shows, to wade right into constitutional crises and, and in, sure. inject themselves in, in places where some would argue, me among them, that they don't belong. So just for the sake of argument, let's say that the, the state does decide to go for broke and press this argument, and I agree with you. I think the argument the, the argument has has merit. I just it just doesn't follow the letter of the law. And I've always thought thought that the letter of the law is a better argument. But say that say that the judge does step forward and say, "Okay, state of Arizona, you got to pay all this money." Do you think the legislature seriously would ignore that? Do you think that's an actual danger? Well, yeah, sure. I think I think that they or or the alternative would be to go into the rest of the budget and exact significant reductions in spending right. to other key areas that will cause significant pain. Oh yeah. And then lay that and lay that at the feet of the courts and at the school uh, the, the Arizona School Board Association who who's a lead plaintiff in this in this lawsuit. That is a possibility too that the school boards uh, could be could theoretically be blamed for letting inmates out of prison because we don't have the money to fund the prison system. Could be sure. uh, 
impacted with regard to funding for road maintenance and construction, could be impacted with state shared revenue payments to cities and counties well, that any, they it, may not get anymore because the state's got to uh, pay this uh, uh, this requirement put on it by the courts. There, there are significant downstream impacts that everybody has to step back and take a look at, not to mention the, the financial impact to what is already a tenuous budget situation because revenue has been declining in Arizona since March. Right. And projections are way down, and we now are looking at a $700 million deficit without this uh, payment to the school system. It could be over a billion well, something... if we have to make this payment. So right. there are downstream repercussions that I think everybody needs to oh, step they, back they, and look at. They definitely do, without a doubt. And uh, you know, when you've got this kind of expenditure that could be ordered, you either have to make cuts elsewhere or bring in additional revenue, one of the two or both. Uh, let me well, ask we can't do that in Arizona without a uh, two-thirds vote of the legislature or right. a popular vote of the people, which I think would also be a significant challenge because, uh, as we've seen in the last couple of election cycles, the vast majority of bonds have failed, uh, budget overrides have failed, and the extension of the sales tax uh, effort was was. Has, has failed as well. And with the recession still in the minds of many people still ongoing, uh, a lot of voters are not inclined to vote themselves a tax increase. Oh, I totally and agree I with you. It's not, not something anybody would want to do. The legislature to approve a tax increase. On the other hand, the voters in their wisdom uh, saw fit to tie the hands of the legislature in this fashion. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure yeah. that, you know, I, I wasn't here during that campaign, but I would... I would venture to say that uh, people warned that something like this could happen down the road, and, and here it is. So, and your previous caller kind of alluded to the issues that are going on in uh, California with regard to Prop 13, and right. because there was a, a similar initiative in, in Colorado that was eventually over, overturned again by the voters. Um, what Arizona really needs is a sunset, like we have for many other things in the state of Arizona, that every 10 years... These valid propositions are re-brought up for a, a, a reapproval mm -hmm. of the voters because things change. Things do and change. And what's really unique, the, the Arizona Secretary of State can provide you this data. After about 10 years, almost 50% of our electorate is new. We have new voters that turned 18. We have people that moved into the state. A lot of voters that have voted for this have either left the state or sadly passed away, and they're not here anymore. So we're being bound, those of us now, by people that voted for this years and years ago that aren't even here anymore. Sure. And the new crop of voters don't have an opportunity to weigh in on it because it requires either referral to the ballot by the legislature or it requires collecting 235,000-some-odd signatures to put it on the ballot. And that's a very difficult threshold. So what we really need is a ballot initiative that requires all referendum uh, passed by the voters to sunset yep. after 10 years and require reapproval so that the voters can question this. I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and alleviate this pressure sometimes that's put uh, on the legislature by forcing them into something. And again, you have a lot of voters, there, I, and there's... A, People on my side of the aisle that probably don't like that idea because there's a lot of uh, referendums that were put forth. Let's, I'll give you an example, like the gay marriage amendment that passed a few years ago. In 10 years, under what I'm talking about, that would have to be reapproved again by the voters. Sure. And there's a chance that that would get overturned. But I think that's the fair way to do it rather than to have people where these things are etched in stone technically – and 30 years later, people that are living here today are being held to a standard that was enacted by people that voted, and many of them are dead yeah. Senator, 30 let me ask years you this. ago that, that we're having to deal with. So yeah, let, let me uh, ask it, you this. It's something that I think we should look at. Uh, you are, um, you're still a very influential voice in the Republican Party. You're a leader here. Uh, we're faced with this, this decision we've got to make now. Do we, do we take the settlement? and shake hands and walk away with uh, just the $317 million on the table, or do we go for broke? What kind of advice are you giving your colleagues in the legislature about that? What should we do? Well, I, I think, I, you know, I think we need to... Well, here's the problem with this. And this is, if you talk to legislative leadership, the worry about setting a precedent like this uh, will then bring on all sorts of lawsuits from all other sorts of groups on all sorts of issues that will then require some sort of a, some sort of a settlement or agreement and it's opening a door, and they don't want to open this door that you can then do appropriations through the courts. Through the courts, that's, yeah, that's, exactly that's, right. That's something that they're really concerned about. So I think you're going to see, and I would predict, significant pushback from legislative leadership to 
negotiate a settlement. I really don't think it's going to happen. I think that uh, what we should do is probably sit down with the school board and say, look, you know, we went through a pretty ugly budget crisis in the state. We were facing down a $3 billion budget deficit back in 2009. That's right. And we had to dig out of this hole. Everybody shared in the pain that went with digging this state out of a financial hole. The last thing we want to do is put the state back in a big hole. What can we do without making it a legal settlement to negotiate in the next budget to increase education spending and come to an agreement that if the legislature increases spending through the legislative budget process, not through an order by the court, that they would drop the lawsuit. That's a win-win for everybody because what you have is you don't have that precedent now set through the courts and you have an agreement to increase education funding that's done through the way it should be done, which is the constitutionally required budget uh, appropriation Sure, process. not by a judge. I think, I think that would be the way to go. And if I were still up there and talking to you know Senate President Andy Biggs, I would tell him that, hey, let's bring these guys in, let's sit them down, let's find a way that we can work through the budget and find a way to increase funding in exchange for them dropping the lawsuit. And I think that would probably be a better path because that way everybody kind of wins. The, the, the school districts get some increases in education funding. The legislature doesn't have to deal with a precedent being set by the courts that you're forced to pay, um, you know, back pay and, or, or back funds or back appropriations based on a, on a court ruling. And I think it would be across the board better for everybody. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think, I think uh, the, the lawyers, sadly, involved get paid uh, a percentage oh, based sure. on what they bring in, and yeah. I know a lot of them are probably looking for a big fat payday. They here. don't if get a payday a, if they don't get a three hundred million yeah. dollar um, uh, ruling for their client. They get you know anywhere from ten to thirty percent of that. So it's a it's a it's a sticky thing to deal with when you're yeah. dealing with lawyers. Plus, they're That's smelling perfect. victory right now because they've got they've gotten these rulings in their favor so far. And this is the point because I've been in settlement conferences, and our producer here, Mark, has. Uh, I think has as well. I know Matt was telling us earlier, one of our callers, that he has. Uh, I've been in settlement conferences, and when you lose a couple of court battles, that's when you start getting hungry to come to the table and, and deal. So well, I think true. they smell that's victory. True. But again, if you, if, you know, and I've been speaking with several of my former colleagues, and I stay in touch with them almost weekly. What they, again, like I just told you earlier, they see the, they agree with the Supreme, all the Supreme Court did is say yes, the legislature, according to the proposition, is required to increase funding 2% a year. And they agree with that. The question now is, this judge in the Maricopa County Superior Court has taken it upon herself to determine the way that she calculates how you calculate that 2% increase. And, and, and that is, I think, what the argument is. And I don't think they're going to they're gonna agree to that. I think yeah. you're going to see continued pushback and say, look, we... The legislature under the state constitution decide on how money is appropriated and the way that that's calculated. And as long as the the two percent per year has been met, then as far as we're concerned, we've met the obligation of the the initiative. And then that will go again to the Arizona Supreme Court, and uh, I guess that'll be where it's finally settled, where the the justices finally decide on what's going to happen. But but I could tell you they'll they'll be doing that under the mindset that their budget. Uh, will likely see an impact uh, from that decision. So there's always that as well, too. And that's the way you do the checks and balances. Right. You, the legislature uh, deals you know, with the other agencies and, and other branches of government through the appropriations process. The governor, of course, controls the veto pen, and, and that's the really only tool the legislature has to control the other two uh, is the appropriations process. So I think there's always that potential, too. So they got to weigh that. Like I said, everybody's got to think of the big picture here. It's not just, you know, what happens if the court says, yeah, the schools get the money. Then the legislature gets to go through the budget process and say, okay, fine. You want us to pay that money? Here's where we're going to Let me ask you money. one final question, then we have to sure. take a break. But what can we do? Because I know, for one, I'm not a believer that, that you just wave money at a problem, you're going to solve it. I think education has all kinds of problems, and only some of them can be solved with money. On the other hand, I don't think there's any question that education in Arizona is underfunded. What can we do going forward to put the money on the table that they actually need without the two sides feeling that they got to sue each other? What can we do going forward to fix that? What you need is you need a dedicated revenue source to fund education. And we have that in this state, but we have underutilized it dramatically. And that's the state trust land system. 
And we were given 10 million plus acres during the Enabling Act that we were supposed to sell and convert into a trust fund. And after 100 years, over 100 years of having this land, we have only sold about a tenth of it, 10%. And that money from those sales goes into a, a basically an annuity that every year generates interest revenue, and that interest revenue then goes to the education system. And I would stop and think for a moment, uh, had we converted that land to private ownership, you get two bangs for the buck. You get a big chunk of money that goes into the state land trust that then funds education, and you have people paying local property taxes, which is also a big supplier of education funding. And if you look at the eastern states, the majority of their education funding comes from property taxes, and the majority of the states back east are in the land in those states are controlled by private ownership. Whereas in Arizona, only about 19% on a good day is controlled by private ownership. And the government, whether it's state, federal, or local, controls the other 81%. And that money and that revenue isn't there because it's not being taxed. And I'm just guessing. And it's not generating income. If we are serious about funding education, we should follow the intent of the Enabling Act and put state trust land up for sale, allow people to buy it and pay the property taxes on and use the money from the sale of those lands to generate revenue for education. We have that mechanism. And I'm just guessing without knowing for sure, but I bet if I looked it up, I would find that environmentalists and preservationists are are four square against that. that. See, yeah. And, you know, I had a big discussion with a bunch of bicyclists that there's this area just uh, near Houghton and Valencia that they call Fantasy Island. I'm sure it's right next to between DM and Houghton Road. Mm -hmm. That is state trust land, and there is an effort to sell that. And the bicyclists are all screaming and hollering, oh, where are we going to go ride our mountain bikes? Well, the reality is if you're stealing money from education is what you're doing by stopping <laughs> that sale. Yeah. And since you, most of those people are not paying the fee that is required to go on state trust land, and many of them are technically trespassing, they are literally stealing money from education. But they will not ever bring that issue up right. because, hey, it's politically correct to go ride your mountain some, bike out in the desert. So some very that's, interesting again, viewpoints. That's the deal. Some very interesting viewpoints you shared with us. And, Senator, I appreciate you calling the show. And please let us hear from you again, man. Take care. Thank you very much. We have to take a break, and we will be back.